So our next presenter is Marnie Bell, and she is presenting enzymatic testing in the wine lab, what to look out for and how to do it well. So Marnie is a specialist scientist for Vintessential Laboratories and also a committee member of IWAG. Growing up in the Mornington Peninsula, Marnie quickly developed a passion for wine and the science behind it. Marnie graduated from Deakin University with a Bachelor of Biological Science majoring in Cell and Molecular Biology. She joined Vintessential Laboratories in 2016 where she currently helps maintain ISO 17025 accreditation. More recently, she has turned her attention to the application of enzymatic wine analysis on discrete analyzers, including method development and customer support. Please welcome Marnie. Okay, thank you for having me. I'm here to talk to you today about enzymatic testing in the wine lab, particularly what you should be um, looking out for to indicate that everything is going okay and how to do it well the first time. So with any method in the lab, it's really important to have not only a basic understanding of the chemistries that are involved, but also the tools that you're using for such analysis. When focusing on enzymes though, the concentration of important compounds are determined using spectrophotometry, which is a science which measures a light beam's intensity as a function of wavelength. So concentration changes of specific substrates during an enzyme catalyzed reaction ultimately provides us with the numbers that allow us to decide, for example, if our wine is dry. Substrates are compounds which enzymes act on, and in wine analysis, the most commonly used substrate is the coenzyme NAD+. So for malic acid, glucose and fructose, and acetic acid, NAD plus is reduced to NADH. Alternately, in ammonia and citric acid, NADH is oxidized to NAD plus. It's this change in NADH concentration, however, that's measured at 340 nanometers, that's stoichiometrically related to the amount of analyte in the assay. So spectrophotometers measure the light that's not absorbed by the sample and the light that's then transmitted to the photometer. So this graph here, you can see that transmittance and absorbance has an exponential relationship. And during enzymatic analysis, it's really important to monitor your absorbance values. And I say this because although many specs can go up to three absorbances more, it does not mean that it's necessarily accurate at these levels. So you can see here that an absorbance of one 90% of light is absorbed by the sample and 10% of light passes through to the spectrophotometer, or the photometer, sorry. And at two absorbents, 99% of light is absorbed by the sample and only 1% of light then passes through to the photometer. So when you're measuring at these really low levels of transmitted light, so two absorbents, for example, even small variances in your photometric accuracy can have really big impacts on your final result. So it's, it's a bit confusing. But there's only one thing to remember, and this is what I remember, is always keep your absorbances below 1.5 for your wine enzymatic methods. This will give you robust and repeatable readings, and there's really no reason to be going over this level for, for our purposes. Keep in mind that absorbances are what makes up a response, and a response is the difference between your blank and your final absorbance. So there's lots of things you can do before and during enzymatic testing to make sure you have the right result the first time. All these points will mean that you have to do extra testing and sometimes it's extra cost, but there's no point in your results if they're completely wrong. Before any of this, however, you actually need to ask yourself one question and that's what are you trying to achieve? Because meaningful results are just as important as accurate results. So for example, is the method or kit you're using suitable for your desired outcome? Will the results provide you with information that is relevant and help make decisions that will positively affect the wine in question? For example, again, if you, use, if you require a volatile acidity figure, is using an acetic acid kit going to give you a meaningful result? Does it matter that you won't achieve that full VA figure if you're using an acetic acid kit? For some people, it's yes, and for some people, it's no. So it's something that everyone needs to consider. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is ensure that you have the right equipment. And this is really essential for good analysis. Before you buy your units, 
do really thorough research on what you need to do and if your chosen instrument can perform these adequately. For example, does your automatic analyzer come with a set of filters that are appropriate for your methods? Do you want to add more? Um, do they have the right amount? Although photometric instrumentation makes analysis much faster and much quicker than traditional methods, it's also really important that you maintain them, just like you would with a car. Poor maintenance can most definitely affect your results, and cleaning and calibration schedules are really, really important to reduce the frequency of breakdowns and poor performances. As each unit is different, and there's lots of them on the market now, you really need to check with your manufacturer on how best to care for them. But refer to the manual as often as possible and always have them accessible to all your staff. But pets can be a big source of error and they should be inspected really uh, regularly for, for grime build up. They're quite easy to take apart and just have a look inside, particularly before lots of volumes of testing. You can also check the volumetric accuracy of them using pure water and a good balance. However, this can sometimes be hard and not practical in most labs. So try and get them externally calibrated at least once a year to ensure their optimal performance. The technique of, pep of pepenning is also really important. It even slight variances in technique between person to person and day to day can really affect your results. So for example, for correct volume dispensing, get tips that fit. If you're aspirating a sample, do it nice and slowly. Don't wave your pet tip about. Um, try and keep the sample vertical and not in the barrel of the pipette. Enzymes are kits, so enzymes are proteins and they will denature at excessive temperatures. They also gradually become inactive past their use by date because as with anything biological, they're never meant to last forever. So always check your fridge temperatures. If you've got a bar fridge and you're keeping your enzymes in that, make sure it's not sitting up in the top compartment where the freezer is. Note when the kit was opened and when your reagents were activated because when your reagents are activated, that will also affect the final expiration of your kit. It's also really important that you never top up your enzymes from one batch to the next. So I see this often when people are decanting their enzymes into new vials. If you're doing so, when you get a new kit, it's really, really important that you rinse out that vial with distilled water. If you are topping up your reagents, from one kit to the next, you will get crystallisation and you will cause inactivity in every new kit that you use until you rinse it out and start fresh. So try against the good habit of doing that every single time. Avoid evaporation, so when it's not in use, keep your lids closed, particularly on hot days and if you're in a lab that isn't well temperature controlled. I've also heard stories of, of um, reagents being in fans as well and that really increases the rate of evaporation. Again, lastly, ensure that your kit is suitable for your desired outcome. So like that acetic versus VA example, make sure that the kit is going to give you results that are meaningful. And if they're not, consider more appropriate kits, or even if your expectations are suitable. Water source. So contamination-free water is really essential. Metals such as copper can be inhibitors to enzymes and then getting to the active side of that enzyme prevent um, substrate conversion to product. Mould is also a really big issue that I've increasingly seen. So often mould doesn't appear just in your water source, it gradually builds up over time, particularly if you're not rinsing out that, that storage vessel that you're keeping your DI water in. If mould gets into your automatic analyzer, it can completely stop testing for a very long time until you can get someone out to clean it for you. That's expensive and it takes a long time. Even if it isn't preventing testing altogether, it can really drastically affect the volumes that are being prepared by your instrumentation. So make sure you're also cleaning your instrumentation, but just try and keep your water source free of mould and visually inspect it routinely to ensure that it's not growing, particularly in the bottom of that vessel. Cuvettes can also be a big source of random error and random error you want to reduce as much as possible. If you're using single-use cuvettes, use them only once. And if you're using cuvettes that can be reused, make sure that you're rinsing that really thoroughly with DI water. As well, if you are using reusable cuvettes, try and rinse them out just after analysis. So don't keep the enzymes in there um, for extended periods of time because it can coat the enzyme walls. 
uh, the, sorry, the cubit walls. Ensure you're using the right path length as well. Uh, and if you're not, then you might need to get other ones or else take that into consideration with your final calculations. It's also really important, obviously, that there's no scratches and marks on them. So visually inspect them. If there's something you can't get off, then you might need to replace it. Otherwise, just give the, the, the side that's in the white part, the good white with the kim white, before you place it into the spec. So the next important uh, aspect to consider for good enzymatic testing in wine is standard analysis. Scientists love to be right, so it's really important that when we're not, we can identify it quickly and easily, and hopefully before anyone else picks up on it as well. Standard analysis with every block of testing should become habitual, and if it's not, work towards an attitude where standard analysis is second nature. It does mean more time, and it does mean more reagents again, but it's a vital part of any laboratory testing all over the world and being a good scientist. Include standards and secondary standards that will provide indication and confidence that your analysis is accurate. And not only indicate that your enzymes are working optimally, but also that the technique, the analyst technique is accurate. So your pre-dilutions, um, your petting, all those sorts of things. In particular, our model wine standards, um, they're usually clear and uh, they shouldn't be any matrix interferences when you're analysing these. <coughs> they contain a little bit of ethanol sometimes to mimic wine and they also contain a little bit of preservative, but otherwise they're quite basic. Because they're so basic, it's really easy to make them up yourselves. Um, dry reagents like malic acid last a really long time, so sometimes it's really good just to have these in the lab, ready to make up for your own standard when you need to. A great benefit is also using them in spike recoveries, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but they're essentially really good just to make sure that there's no matrix interference in, interferences in your final results. So secondary standards, again, ensure that no matrix interference is occurring. It's really important to consider how well your secondary standards reflect the wines for analysis. They also tell us if our sample pretreatments are correct, or even if our sample pretreatments are affecting the result in a negative way. Try to plot them on a control chart to identify bias and outliers easily. And the standard wants to be of a matrix and it's also an expected concentration of your wines for important checks. For example, if you're testing sucrose, glucose and fructose in sparkling wines and you're expecting 20 to 25 grams per litre, don't have a standard that's at 5 grams per litre. You want to be making sure that your analysis is completing the reaction at upper limits, but also your pretreatments like pre-dilution is occurring accurately. If you're checking if your wine is completing malolactic fermentation, don't have a standard that's a white at one gram per litre of malic acid. Ensure that they're reflecting your samples accurately. If you're still in doubt, a fantastic way to, to check your samples is grab out your last eyewag <coughs> bottle. So for example, if you don't do Moscato's often and you don't have a standard for it, eyewag has a Moscato and you've got the results already there. So grab that out and you can test that too. So spike recovery is uh, a really great troubleshooting tool and they're particularly handy when you suspect something has gone wrong. Spike recovery is measured trueness and they ensure that the result you're getting is close to the actual value because your samples might be accurate, or so they might be precise, but they not be, may not be close to the true value and this can be an indication of systematic bias in the method. So we're going to go over the calculation. Um, it's there if you want afterwards. But you're generally aiming for a 95 to 105% recovery of your spiked sample. Depending on the uncertainty of the method, you may be aiming for 90 to 110%. If you're falling outside of the range of your spike analysis, then remake your spike and retest. But if you're consistently getting 110% recoveries on these, then it indicates something like a high bias. And similarly with a low, you know, 90% 90, 90 recovery. These are what, uh, as well, what model wine standards are really good for, to have to spike samples. So sample preparation is vital for, for correct results. 
you should always refer to your enzymatic method for sample pretreatments that need to be made. Uh, that's what methods are for, and you should follow it the same way every single time. Benchtop specs usually require more sample pretreatment simply because of the more volume that you're seeing, and obviously you have to do all the dilutions yourself um, and think a little bit closely about what wine or what dilutions suit which wine, that sort of thing. Um, working with enzymes means you're always going to have an upper limit uh, where the enzymes have converted as much substrate over to product. When there's substrate saturation and your enzymes can't convert oil all over this substrate, you'll get a low recovery. So this is why we pre-dilute. When you're preparing samples for glucose and fructose for uh, sugar analysis, they're going to they're need a, a larger dilution than a dry red. So it's really important to take this into consideration and look at your wines and decide what's the best pre-dilution for this. Because it goes the other way. If you over-dilute, you introduce significant error. You start to not only, so alternatively you could be going over the test limit, but with over-diluting you start to go below the LOD. And this means that your response of your blank would be similar to the response of an over-diluted sample. So the general rule of thumb is always use the lowest possible dilution rate to get you under the upper limit, but don't go any lower. The degassing. So bubbles, obviously, they cause a bit of a hindrance to the ability of the specs, um, ability to read the light transmitters. It may be obvious by constantly changing fluctuations on your bench top spec or random error on an automatic analyzer. With automatic analyzers as well, they can sometimes cause sensing errors if they're quite large. The best way I can, the best way to get rid of these is just to tap your cuvette on the bench to get your bubbles up to the top. You can also do these sample cups if you're putting a sample into a discrete analyzer. Um, but the biggest problem that we see with gas is the random error in pipetting and DA probes if it's sucking up large amounts of air. So you're automatically going to get a low recovery for that sample. Really good if it's really bubbly, just degas it. And I find the easiest way is to tap it just on the bench. So coloured wines definitely affect a lot of assays. Most people use PVPP to decolorize. Um, again, refer to your methods with the best ways to do this because sometimes you may not need to decolorize if you're already diluting. But it's really important that you're trialing this first before you make this decision. Carbon can be used on some occasions, but if your method doesn't mention carbon, then don't use it because carbon is really good at stripping out a lot of things like color, but as well as malic acid and citric acid, it will take them all out. Of course, um, highly coloured and turbid wines will also inhibit your, the ability of the light path to go through the, the sample, and it will cause erratic responses and fluctuations. In extreme cases, solids such as, um, as grape skin and even seeds can cause blockages in your discrete analyzer or your automatic analyzer, and that's a nightmare to get out, and again, really expensive. So try and, try and just pick out anything that's quite large. I find the easiest way to do this is just to syringe filter it through a 0.45 micron filter before it goes into any sample vessel. So benchtop spectrophotometry is the, the most popular method for enzymatic methods. Um, it is cheaper, it, but it is high in labour. Otherwise, it's quite robust and cheap to run. The concentration of analyte is determined by this calculation here. Uh, I won't read it out, but if you do change any of those parameters, you need to make sure that you're accounting for it in your final calculations. As well as your usual standards, you should be running a blank with every set of uh, analysis. This accounts for any change in the assay absorbance itself during the course of the, the, the testing. So if you're running a really big batch, try and keep track of your, the blank absorbances across this. It accounts for any baseline drift in the spectrophotometer as well. Duplications are also necessary to monitor robustness and repeatability. However, I understand that it's not always practical to run a duplication every single time, but just keep it in mind that every now and then try and get a couple of readings just to ensure that your, your results aren't completely random. Because if you can't get two results that are the same, then how do you know the rest of the results are okay? <coughs> 
So what to watch out for? Um, this can be applicable to, to both benchtop and discrete analyzers. And it's really important to pick these up when they're occurring. When you're seeing a low recovery, ensure that your kit is in date and has been stored correctly. Enzymes that have perished or their activity has decreased significantly will show a low recovery. Ensure that the reagents have been room, uh, warmed to room temperature as well because cold reagents, uh, they make reversible changes to the enzymes. Once it's warmed up to room temperature, they should be fine to go. At the same time, when you're warming up your reagents, warm up your bench top spec as well. Make sure that's ready to go too. Of course, ensure that you're working within the kit range. So if you're going outside of the, the upper limit, your enzymes won't be able to convert all over the, sub, the, convert the substrate to product. If you dilute too much, again, you start to see the same issue. So you start to introduce significant error. If the sample also contains no, no negligible amounts of the, the compound being analyzed, such as malic acid, we see this a lot, negative values, can, negative values can also be exaggerated. So just be aware that this can happen sometimes as well. Uh, relevant sample prep. So matrix interferences will cause low recoveries. And a model wine standard can help eliminate this as a cause. Uh, if you're over diluting your sample as well, that will cause it too. Ensure your incubation times are accurate. A lot of people um, are different with how they keep track of the incubation times. Sometimes people get distracted and they walk off and they let it sit for too long. Other times they're in a rush and they do it too quick. If you do it too quick, full conversion of substrate to product won't occur. Colder temperatures, however, can also affect your incubation times. So if you're in a, in a poor lab, uh, temperature controlled lab, it might be a good idea to increase the incubation times. But again, you should really trial this before you do it. Uh, chemistry such as acetic acid, if you start to go too long over that incubation time, it actually causes a high bias instead of a low bias. So again, really uh, keep to your times. And if not, then you need to be trialling if it's accurate or not. Ensure you correct reagent prep. So if you're over diluting your enzymes, then it means you're dispensing less into your assay. And have you been using your reagents once they've been prepped within the specified time? High blank recovery will also cause low recoveries because blank assay activity is a sign of contamination. And then it, when it's using the calculation, it therefore causes low standard and analysis or sample recovery. Uh, high recoveries as well. Uh, eliminate sources of contamination, such as your cuvettes, give your pet tips, um, or uh, contamination on your DA probes. Ensure that you correct, uh, your incubation times are correct as well. So like I said, with acetic acid, if you let it sit for too long, that, that, um, that reaction keeps going, sorry. So it, it will keep going and give you a high bias. Incorrect reagent prep, again, such as under diluting, will cause a high bias. Too much sample being injected into your assay, so perhaps you've accidentally added double or you've added a few microliters every single time. And lastly, check your photometric accuracy. Um, this is probably your last thing that you want to check, and I'll go over it in the next slide, um, but it is a possible um, explanation for high recoveries. Fluctuating absorbance. So the biggest reason for fluctuating absorbance is incorrect uh, sample pretreatment. As I said, keep your absorbances below 1.5 because if they're too high, it will fluctuate. Ensure your colour is minimised, there's no solids and there's no gas. Also ensure that your cuvette is lined up correctly. And this goes with both bench tops and discrete analyzers. If the light path is catching on the side of that cuvette, it will cause random error. Check your, also your power supply, it may be fluctuating. And lastly, check your instrument for faults using the manual. So every instrument is different and everyone will, will say for different things, but generally it's, there's four main parameters to measure and that's wavelength accuracy, photometric accuracy, linearity and stray light. Again, refer to your manufacturers for these checks. Um, And particular attention should be paid to the absorbances that you're getting when you're doing these checks. You want to pick up issues before testing starts to increase. Lamps will fail eventually, so it's really important that if they are starting to, to um, degrade, that you pick it up.
Random error. Unfortunately, random error can be quite difficult to pick up unless it occurs when you're running duplicates, standards, and calibrations. So the aim is to try and reduce this occurrence as many times as possible, and when it does, be able to pick it up easily and solve it quickly. Sometimes though, you won't find out, and just a simple retest will fix the issue, but if it is consistently occurring, then you've got a problem on your hand. If you're reusing cuvettes, this is the most common source of contamination, as enzymes can sometimes coat walls of cuvettes. Pipetting errors, such as large air gaps, uh, will cause random error as well, or even the tipping the pipette on an angle when you're dispensing, or so when you're aspirating. Be consistent between samples, and ensure the method of interpretation is not only the same with you day to day, but also colleagues day to day. And that's what methods are for, so there's not really much interpretation that you can do. A cuvette facing the wrong way can cause random error, of course, and also having scratches and marks on it. I do on some occasions see that some analyzers will have a bias straight after running a sample with a high concentration of analyte beforehand. So for example, um, sometimes if someone runs a Moscato and the next sample along is a drier wine, the next one will have a high bias because that probe tip hasn't washed out properly. And so just be aware of that. Sometimes that can be a cause and if you are seeing random error, have a look at the sample beforehand. Bias. So bias consistently means getting above or below an actual figure and it can get worse over time if you're not on top of it. Storing kits at suboptimal temperatures will cause it, uh, such as low recovery. So again, check your fridge temperatures, check that your enzymes are in date and active. Gradual contamination can also occur over time, such as the dipping of the same pet tip from sample to buffer, because that buffer is then always going to be contaminated. Probes and pipettes consistently aspirating and dispensing the wrong volume is one of the biggest culprits of this. For example, if you're finding that you're always getting, you're always getting a high bias on your IWAG enzymatic methods, then consider if your pipette is potentially uh, dispensing an extra 10 microliters every single time, because that would be a good explanation for that. Crude dilutions being performed inaccurately can also be an issue, such as um, <coughs> the pipettes being inaccurate, like I've just mentioned, the volumetric glassware as well, or also by human error when using these tools. So perhaps the, the water isn't at 20 degrees, uh, those sorts of things are user errors that can be cleaned up quite quickly. So I'll just touch on discrete analyzers quickly. Um, they're a great automated way to conduct enzymatic analysis. They calculate a calibration curve from a series of known standard solutions. And the sample is analysed on the same method and its response is quantified against this curve. It does cut out a lot of user error and it does relieve a lot of time. However, there are times that it cannot be as robust as manual methods. As with anything though, there's a, you can reduce the amount of error by having good, uh, cali uh, good calibration schedules good maintenance schedules, all those sorts of things. It's important that only are you working within the limits of the instrument, uh, the kit, but you're also working within the limits of the instrumentation. And now you've got a two-factor consideration to, to work with. One of the biggest mistakes I also see is that people leave all the thinking to the instrument. So people will look at the concentration and that's the final result. But it's also really important to look at res your responses and if you've seen something weird, have a look at your, your final absorbance and your blank absorbance and consider what's causing any discrepancies between those. So when you're setting up a, a trial or you're setting up a new method on a discrete analyzer, always trial it first. There are lots and lots of instruments on the market now and unfortunately kits can't always uh, match every single one and some uh, tweaks to water volumes, sample volumes, dilutions have to be made. When you're creating your method, ensure that you have a nice response range from zero to one. If you concentrate all those calibrators at one end, then it means you're probably going to have, uh, you, if, you're, if there's a slight variance in absorbances, it's going to affect your final result quite significantly. Always keep your enzymes and sample ratios the same. Try not to change them. And calibrate before every run. Uh, so environments can change quite quickly. And it's really important that these are reflected within the samples themselves. I understand that a lot of people don't like doing it because of the extra cost and because of the extra time. 
but it's a really good habit to work towards and it shouldn't be seen as a burden. It should be seen as something that you just have to do before you test. Many issues that are picked up in a calibration aren't picked up during sample analysis. So it's really important to always do it um, and, and monitor it closely as well. Again, always analyze the data after it. So monitor your calibration data, run standards and plot them on a chart. Don't accept your results blindly. Lastly, have your team trained in routine cleaning and maintenance of the instrumentation and ensure that the unit is serviced regularly. Cleaning is really, really important with discrete analyzers. You're pipetting two microliters to 10 microliters at a time sometimes. Any variances in the instrumentation itself can cause big error. So this is the most problematic calibration that I see. And if a line was drawn between each calibrator, you'd see a curve. This one is really dramatized, and I did this with bad maths. So generally, you're either looking out for, for high recovery on your middle standards and low recovery on your, your end standard and your, your lowest standards as well. It can be due to a really wide range of problems. However, the biggest culprit is low recovery, particularly low recovery at your top ends. So there's nothing really probably wrong with your first four points, it's generally your fifth and sixth points that are pulling the rest of the results out. So the first place to look is again your low recovery. So your pre-dilutions, your enzymes, um, your sample prep, all those sorts of things, look at what's giving you a low recovery. For this example, if I needed to test something quickly, what I could do is I could omit the last two points and accept a calibration curve from zero to five grams per litre. In doing so, I can't test above five grams per litre, but I can at least test the wines that are below that. If you're consistently seeing this sort of curve though, m try to investigate as to why it's occurring. Uh, when trialling new methods, this, this curve isn't robust. So if you see here you've got zero and a 16 gram per litre calibrator, you're going to find that duplications at these ends are going to be quite varied. So when you're trialling a new method, try to have your calibrator spread evenly along your response curve. Again, um, this one here, you can see that the last two duplications are quite varied. And if you look at the y-axis, these points are sitting at around 2 to 2.5 absorbances. Here, only 1% of light passes through the photometer. You can see on this one here that you that this, this, this specific assay, glucose and fructose, and on this machine, it's just not working. There are some automatic analyzers and certain methods, generally not enzymatic though, and you certainly don't need to do it for wine enzymes, or wine enzymatic methods, but you can get away with high responses. But like I said, for our purposes, you just don't need to go up this high. So if you get a poor calibration, recalibrate straight away. It could be that your enzymes were just too cold omit single large outliers, it's perfectly acceptable as long as you're still maintaining a robust calibration. If you're always uh, omitting the same calibrator point, all those sorts of things, if it continually reoccurs, then you've probably got a bigger issue on your hands. Double check your reagents and your standards are in the right position. This threw me for about two days early in the week um, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out why I couldn't get a reaction occurring. And then you need to also um, double check that you're using the right method. This one threw me for about a week a few months ago when I was uh, calibrating water chlorides but testing for PDL chlorides. Investigate any kit malpractices. So again, if your enzymes are in date, are they stored correctly? Are they working optimally? So in conclusion, when you're maintaining good equipment and correct sample pretreatments, you should have no trouble at all analysing standards and sample results. Working towards good analysis should become habitual and if, it's, and if you don't, then it means that the likelihood of error will continue um, to increase. When error does occur, it's important to trust your instinct and use the data available to go back to basics and identify the most plausible explanation. <coughs> should given all of this you're still having issues? Get the help of a colleague to just look over the data or even to do the analysis themselves without you telling them what's wrong. If, if you're still having issues, go back to your kit manufacturer, quintessential laboratories, 
And if it's deemed to be instrumental, your unit supplier. If doing so, ensure that you have the appropriate data as well to give to those suppliers so they can make an informed conclusion about your problem. So keep on doing your eye samples and next round we should see some pretty good results for enzymatic methods. <laughs>